research and development by companies such as this have meant huge advances in the manufacture of dentures. Highly skilled technicians like Ruth Burke are building dentures of quite exceptional quality. Her skills and experience are sought by leading clinicians worldwide and also by people like Julie, one of many dental patients whose lives have been transformed by the work of technicians like Ruth. Her current dentures were made for her 12 years ago by Ruth Burke and Dr. John Besford when they were at the London Hospital. Now, bone resorption has taken place and the teeth have worn down. As a result, Julie is overclosed and needs a new set, which Dr. Besford and Ruth will be making for her. As she does so, Ruth is going to share her knowledge with us and with Patrick Lundy, a dental technician from Northern Ireland. I mounted the casts with the occlusal rims that Dr. Besford gave me, with the centre line marked and perfectly trimmed. One of the secrets of Ruth's success is the very close collaboration and clear communication between herself in the laboratory and the clinician. She often works with Dr. Besford, now a specialist prosthodontist with a referral practice in London's Harley Street. Dr. Besford took copied dentures with Julie, and that's because um, Julie is already wearing a denture that Dr. Besford has made, so we have the aesthetic established there. And if you were going to use this copied denture, we would have it mounted, and we would use all the information of the tooth size and position. But in most cases, we're not going to be working with a copied denture. So we're going to um, proceed with this case using the occlusal rims. How could you uh, pick the shape and size of the teeth? Well, ideally with the um, photographic information, but in this case Julie didn't have any photographs and when we made the original denture we used the cast of a sister that's four years younger. Her mother had very similar teeth as well, this overlap of the centrals. And so as you can see here, this is the copy denture, has that information. It also, if we look there, has that, the two centrals overlapping. So for this case, we're going to work from the occlusal rims and the information from the Alma gauge, but use the width of that central to choose the Enigma teeth. On a new denture, Julie's having Enigma teeth. This photograph of Julie's sister is very useful for Dr. Besford and Ruth to work from, as well as the cast of her teeth. On a photograph, it's hard to gauge the shape of all the individual anterior teeth, but I have that information here, which is very helpful. Dr. Besford likes to set his own teeth at the chair side, using photographs and input from the patient. Most clinicians prefer to leave this stage to the technician. Ruth always encourages them to supply her with as much information as possible. Specifically, a copy of the best dentate photograph, a measurement of the patient's pupil distance, Alma gauge readings, and tooth shades for incisors and canines. Right, now I go back to the first eye. Yep, the other one. OK something like 61, 62 millimetres. We measure that same distance on the photograph. It's exactly 12 millimetres. Right, now we do a more difficult thing, which is to measure the width of the two central incisors, if they're, if they're touching and they're not overlapped. 3.2, 3.3. 61.5 divided by the pupil distance on the photo, which is 12 millimeters. Right, 12 times the width of the upper two centrals is 3.3 millimeters. Right, 3.3 equals 16.9. Mm. Okay. Right, so divide. That's two. Front the width two. of two front teeth. Divide by two equals 8.3. Four, five, 8.5. Interpupillary distance on the patient 
divided by interpupillary distance on the photograph, multiplied by the width of the two front teeth on the photograph, divided by two, equals the width of a single central incisor. Back at the lab, working on Julie's case, it was simpler to measure the teeth from the sister's cast, though it's very rare for such a cast to exist. If you're in a situation where you're working from a photograph and choosing the teeth yourself, I measured the central width and looking at the shape of this tooth and it's a pretty square tooth, it's a very broad tooth, it's about nine millimeters. So I'm looking on the square mold and 9.4 is S15. In natural teeth, you normally have quite a long contact point. In denture teeth, if we look at a close mold, normally you have a, quite a short contact point lower down towards the incisal. So when you're looking at these photographs and copying cases, you can go slightly bigger because you can shave a little off the mesial or distal to get that long contact point, especially if you've got teeth that are overlapping. With these Enigma teeth, you can choose centrals, laterals, and the canines, they come in pairs. I can specifically match each tooth. So the teeth that I've chosen on this case are the S15 for the central, then the laterals, the S17, because it's a very wide lateral, so I don't need the length of the tooth, and so I probably grind some incisal and wax over the neck, and then D99 for the canine. In the posterior teeth, I actually have chosen the P6, which is a larger mold in natural teeth. That's quite a large premolars there. Now I've chosen the teeth, I'm going to uh, set them in the positions using the information on the occlusal rim. But before I start, I'm just going to verify the alma gauge reading, which is 10 here. And then our vertical is seven. That keeps it in the right position so it can, when it goes back for the trying of the eight anterior teeth, um, the clinician can uh, change that tooth position then, but in the mouth, whereas for me to change it, um, I have no verification unless I use my Alma gauge reading. I'm going to set the anterior teeth. I just cut out a window of wax. I chose this tooth and it was um, slightly too big because I was going to just parallel the sides of it and trim the mesial aspect where it laps over. So I'm just going to slightly trim this. and place it in position in the occlusal rim. And also looking at the cast, and I need to twist out the distal edge. Ruth continues to set the eight front teeth. It's preferable to set eight because the first premolar gives you a better idea of the smile than just having the canines and a block of pink wax. So I've set the eight for a try-in and as you can see I've copied the twisting of the teeth from Julie's sister but the arch form is narrower here and you can use that information but you must stay within the occlusal rim that's been trimmed by the clinician. The final thing I, I do is just to uh, put them on the Alma gauge and uh, verify the readings that I had from the occlusal rim, which in this case it's 10 and 7. And uh, at that point I also take a black marker and uh, mark the incisal position. Well, why do you just uh, put on the your anterior teeth? Well, in this case, um, I'm setting the anterior teeth from the rim or the photograph and the information and I, I give just the eight because if you had the six you'd have the wax, uh, a wax rim in the smile yeah. so the eight takes it kind of around that corner and you can get a good idea of the aesthetics and I don't put the rest of the teeth on so that when it goes back to the um, clinician he can 
easily move those teeth and he doesn't have to move all the posterior teeth out of the way. Mm. And often if you send a whole setup back, sometimes uh, just for little minute movements, yeah. the clinician's inclined not to move it. And so sure. we're um, spending the time to get the aesthetics right. Okay. Once the setting of the first date has been tried and approved by clinician, nurse and patient, Ruth sets the posterior teeth. We have a minimum amount of wax, so then when we add the teeth we can move the position easily. With this tooth, I don't want to trim a large amount of the neck off. So I'm going to hold it in this position and I'm just going to trim the bulk of the tooth from behind in the shape of the ridge instead of just cutting it across the top and taking off the neck of the tooth. So now I've set the remaining posterior teeth. The wax is pretty warm so I can move them around and I use the flat plane to remember to put the premolars and the molar at a right angle to the flat plane. It's a, an important point to remember. The teeth are made to occlude and to balance if you put them in the right position. And this is a shallow curve because these teeth are a fairly shallow cusp angle. So now, uh, having positioned the upper right quadrant, I now set the lower right quadrant to get the intercuspation and to see um, the arch form, how it's going to go together. With Enigma teeth, it's possible to set the teeth in balanced or lingualized occlusion, depending on which occlusal scheme has been chosen for the patient. In Julie's case, Dr. Besford has requested balanced occlusion, omitting the last molar to reduce the load on the lower ridge. Also, Julie has an angles class one molar relationship. I've had to make a, a choice on the size of the lower anteriors. And when we looked on um, Julie's sister's cast, she had quite large um, lower anterior teeth. And if we were to set the posteriors um, in intercuspation on both sides, it would leave us with a, a very narrow space. And we could leave off um, an incisor, but in this case, um, we're putting them all on because aesthetically, Julie has such a a great smile and she does show lower anterior teeth. And here we're doing the, uh, the largest anterior mold in what's a, a small mouth, but we've chosen it to match the cast that we have of Julie's sister and aesthetically um, it, it's very pleasing. And there you see, having set the teeth at the long axis straight, the lower teeth just all pop into place. Ruth checks the positions of the teeth on a standard semi-adjustable articulator. In this case, she also uses a magnetic split cast system to be able to detach the cast. I've trimmed the cast back for easy access into the anter anterior section for waxing up. The teeth have been positioned using the minimum of wax. Now she starts to add wax to achieve a natural gingival contour. She uses a wax roll to drip the bulk wax into position around, but not all over, the teeth. One thing we need to look at, we're fortunate to have this dentate cast, so we've got anatomy that we can follow. Here we can see that there's this buccal ridge running along here, so that would be a bulk of wax here. Often on dentures what you see um, is each individual tooth with a root in the posterior region, and and a very thin gingival roll. So we can see that ridge that kind of dips in on the premolars then comes out to the canine here. So what I'm gonna do is when I add, I've added the bulk wax and we look in the same here, we've got a ridge of wax that we can start to form that shape. So when I'm waxing them on the bulk carving and then when I start to wax the gingival margin, I, I go around the um, crown height of the tooth with my lacron and I hold it at a 90 degree angle to the tooth and um, most textbooks tell you to hold it at 45 degrees but 45 degrees gives you a, a chamfer of wax up to the tooth and the thickest part of the wax then is quite a distance away where the light hits it 
if you hold it at 90 degrees you get a sharp angle um, by the crown height of the tooth and then you can just round that off and the light will hit the gingival margin close to the tooth like in a natural case. So when I'm developing the root eminence on the initial carving I usually um, hold the model upside down so I can look down upon the tooth and along the long axis and develop the root eminence to match the long axis of each tooth. When you just carve them individual and it doesn't match, that's when they look unnatural. In the palette, I'm uh, developing the gingival margins, but I'm revealing as much as possible there because the patient's tongue can feel that. So when I've done the bulk, that primary carving, developing the shapes, I then use a finer instrument and I use a half hollow back. So now I'm just going to clean up the margins and take the final bits of wax out. You can see anteriorly, even though I've gone around with a sharp instrument, that interstitially there's still some wax on this um, left segment. So what I do now is floss between the teeth. So I take the floss and I pull the floss between the teeth and then I pull it across and back so you can actually form the papilla in between there by using the floss to just carve that. I now use the um, electric wax knife and just add some wax, bringing what I call an S-curve over the mesial aspect of that tooth. And we can see that, that using the, the wax sets and you get a nice gingival curve here, the papilla there. And we call it, I call this an S-curve, because where it hugs the tooth on a mesial or distal aspect. And you can see instead of coming just completely round like a, a letter C here, now it comes up and it's like an elongated S. And if we take a quick look at <clears throat> Julie's sister's case, we can see clearly there, there's that S curve. We haven't revealed the mesial face of the, of the lateral there. It's got a nice big fat papilla because it's a young person and it looks like an S curve. So now I've added all the S-curves and we can and look at this from a different angle, we can see that it begins to look very natural. So now we're going to um, flame it and stipple it. So you just brush the flame slightly over the wax, not melting the gingival roll, and then press the sponge in to the softened surface. And then a, a light flame over the surface brings up the mottled effect which reflects the light like natural gingiva. Now that Ruth is happy with the setup so far, she sends it back to the clinician for the all-important patient try-in of teeth and gum contour. Really, really nice. Mum, can't think of anything. No, I think they look lovely. They feel right. But just have a re you know, don't be polite. The teeth and gums have been approved so it's back to the lab for final waxing and finishing the dentures. To stop the trial denture warping in the mouth, Ruth had made a clear acrylic base. The first thing I do is remove the palette so I can re-wax it to a specific thickness. Ruth replaces the teeth on the cast ready to wax in a palette of even thickness all over and add the custom rugai for Julie. You can see this base is a uh, pretty good fit. It's close to the cast. Got it down in the right place. I just have to um, check all my contours around here that everything's clean and where I want it before I seal the model down and put the palette in. We can clearly see the rugai here. And so I'm going to put in um, wax rugae that's suggestive of Julie's own. OK, 
have the incisive papilla here. See, we just add the wax and that's slightly stylized it's not as complicated as her natural rugae that has um, a lot more crevices in but she can feel the bumps in the um, right places but it's um, more self-cleansing and we'll put the enigma color tones on there to highlight it so it's something that she'll be able to see as well I take the lacron and just define the wax that I just added You can see on the palatal aspect, well, it's important that the feel on the tongue should be um, right, and we've revealed the singular aspects of these teeth, of the anterior teeth, so that the patient can feel that it's not waxed up to the incisal level behind here with a very, with a flat, smooth plane. We're sh we're revealing as much as that tooth as possible, and again, when I mentioned these S curves, we've got this reverse curve here. We've not cut the whole thing out. We've got a curve going down, so it looks like a little V behind some of these teeth. And if we take a look, like we have been at um, Julie's sister's cast, we can see that natural rugae, and there's the V, and you've got the whole of the palatal aspect of the anterior teeth that the tongue can feel. So here we have the finished wax up, and you can see the, um, the light reflection and it, it's reflecting off the gingival margins it, evenly and close to the tooth. You can see here. And then picking up the stippling in areas like this that just breaks up the light. And then when, when we have the finished denture, we'll show again that we reproduce that detail. We don't lose it when polishing. And you can see between the central and the lateral there, there's a fairly long contact point, but there's no wax because of the stippling. And if we open up the lower, we can see the stipple between those anterior teeth. At this point, you can show in, in lateral excursion that we have contact. It goes across, and then on the other side, where because of our, the positioning of our lower anteriors for aesthetics, we have the edge-to-edge -edge cuspation here. <laughs>